How you guys doing? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, you guys world premiered your movie last night. Um, what the hell is it like to world premiere a movie at the Toronto Film Festival? I mean, it's it's like a, a once in a lifetime experience for me. This is my first time here, and the film means so much to me. And we put so much love and hard work into it. It was just incredible to see it on the big screen. <laughs> And not even having had a cast and crew, yeah. just the very first time an audience had seen it. And I, I so nervous, I almost didn't sort of join in and sit down. <laughs> but I think it's really important to be there for that. And I'm really glad that I did do it. And my, I was just, I was, you know, my stomach was just nuts. <laughs> yeah. and I just, but it was worth it, you know? It was yeah. to be there and to see people reacting to it and to witness people's behavior during the film and how they responded to it yeah. was a real treat. So I'm glad I did it. Um, I would say that almost every single person watching this interview will not have seen the movie yet. So um, I hate asking the generic question, but can you talk a little bit about who you play, what the film is about? Sure. So it's a coming of age folk story, um, kind of in the vein of like a Thomas Hardy novel like Tess of the D'Urbervilles. However, it gradually gets slightly more eerie mm. and sinister and <laughs> mysterious mm -hmm. and evolves. <laughs> um, set in Snowdonia. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my, my, it's my character kind of growing up and taking on the responsibilities of becoming an adult in the face of this hostile community and uh, the, the hostilities of nature as well. That's, that plays a big part in it. And obviously the landscape as a whole, that, that's a huge part of the film too. I was going to say, one of the things as I watched it was there's just a real sense of dread. Like <laughs> as you're watching, you're like, you know, it's just, I, I don't want to curse on camera, but the shit keeps going bad. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it just it keeps on peeling and it's like, you know, worse and worse. Talk a little bit about um, in the writing process, uh, because you have a lot of interesting shots of like nature and, you know, how is that in the script in terms of the way you wrote it and how much is it, you know, figuring out how you're going to do it on set? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with the word dread. Mm -hmm. It was one of the key words to me that I kept going back to because I wanted to create that feeling of knowing there's something out there, yeah. but not knowing what it is. And that sense of out of frame or outside in the dark, there's something waiting. Um, I grew up in a rural community and I even remember just hearing noises outside. Like even as a kid, I didn't know and the sound of foxes is such an incredibly oh, creepy noise yeah. and how your mind would play tricks on you. And I wanted to, take that idea of trying to understand the unknown and how terrifying that can be, mm. um, especially in this isolated farm that we have the film set in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really the film is a journey through dread and tension and just use that eerie landscape. Yeah. I think that's the, that's one of the big, I think, experiences people took away from it at the premiere really, yeah. which was really fun to see. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I was gonna say, but how is that in the script in terms of are you, you know what I mean? Because there are those quiet moments, like there's a few shots where it's like, you know, through the window or it's just like these tranquil things and you're building up this sense. Mm. So how is it on the page or do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't write this bit is really tense or <laughs> I, it's like it's hard because you you want to give a sense of the tone. So I do describe the landscape and hopefully try and give a feeling through that that hopefully is maybe helpful to you. But then mm. some of the shots you find and you, you, the idea comes to you from the space. So yeah. the landscape, so the opening, the second shot, the opening scene, which is on that rock, that almost monolithic looking rock, mm. is the location that I found just exploring the area. So I wrote into the film because of it's just inherently mythological, creepy feeling quality. Mm. How was it for you uh, reading this? Well, how, how did you get attached to the project? I'm assuming you went in and auditioned, uh, did you? Yeah, yeah. So I met Will and we, we had a meeting and then I, I went in again and we kind of like went through a couple of scenes and talked it through. And then it all just kind of went <laughs> through there. It was like a really easy process. Did he tell you at the time, by the way, uh, we're, you know, no makeup. Uh, we're going to, you know, the outfits, the whole thing. I mean, yeah, I turned up for my audition looking, you know, I'd, I'd not wash my hair or no makeup. I'm, I'm not particularly a girly girl in that sense. I didn't really mind, you know, just <laughs> turning up as I am. Ooh. But yeah. <laughs> More trudging through the mud and That's, the weather yeah. conditions that you handled admirably. Um, <laughs> I think the entire crew respected you for that. That, um, that was good fun. But that was really good something. <laughs> we did, yeah, we're going to shoot it in Snowdonia in November and December. 
yeah. Uh, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Some hardcore weather. Yeah, yeah. that was cool. <laughs> um, for each of you, I always am curious about memorable moments from filming. Like, what's the day you're always going to remember? Oh, wow. I feel like every single day there was something that happened where it was just... Well, there's the day we turned up to set and we could we had to take all the lights down because oh, it was 70 mile gosh. an hour wind outside yeah. or the day we had to evacuate a location because it had flooded. Yeah. Or the, the day we turned up when it had snowed, <laughs> so none of the continuity matched. Yeah. Or the day where there was an actual blizzard, so we just decided to film it anyway, because it looked really cool. <laughs> yeah, rewrote the scene to work in the weather. That one worked, worked nicely. That was a cool one. We were constantly battling those conditions. Yeah. But huh. it comes across in the film, I think. So. Yeah. Was that the day that you're going to the next door neighbor's house? Uh, certainly one of the days, yeah, yeah, it just started snowing. It was it was great, just yeah. looking up like, oh, okay, let's work with this. <laughs> uh, I'm always curious about the editing process because that's the final rewrite. How much of what you wrote resembles like the final finished film that people end up seeing? Well, along the process, I have quite a fluid approach anyway. So there are scenes that aren't scripted that we shot that just felt right or the idea came to us. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's scenes where there was dialogue and then we shot without any dialogue. Yeah. So, so I keep that process going. So I'm, yeah. I know that I'm looking to further the story, get inside your character's head, keep the dread building. So I, I'm really quite open-minded in the edit. And if the editor's got a suggestion about, you know what, this scene isn't serving the story, it's not helping us learn anything more about Gwen, mm. I'm quite happy for it to go. Um, <laughs> So quite, yeah, I think I like keeping it fluid, really, the whole process, just being open-minded. Yeah. Uh, how long was your first cut compared to the finished film? Um, not a huge amount longer. <laughs> um, probably only like five or so minutes longer. Oh, so it's nothing dramatic. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we shot for five weeks, mm. and uh, I think in that time, that's, you know, we got all the material we could, in the, yeah. and it, we would, it was never like a, you know, three-hour assembly it was always <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe fi maybe five minutes is understanding a little bit but it wasn't much longer <laughs> yeah. at all yeah. uh I'm for uh for both of you mm. uh i'm always also curious about challenges of making the, the film so for you what was the big challenge in um actually an acting question a lot of times I, when i speak to people at actors they talk about how the first they have to figure out the first thing about the character and once mm. they break through and get that one thing then all of a sudden it all makes sense yeah. so what was that first thing you needed to figure out or how did you break in i think for me that that first breakthrough was probably the accent it's a it's like a specific north welsh accent and i was very lucky because a lot of the crew were from the area that i needed to base that accent on so the minute i could actually feel as if i'd got the character's voice and that you know i'd I kind of captured that then it meant that i could work on the rest of the character and kind of feel that i was based where where she was i was kind of in her world at that point um uh I just lost my train of thought, but I was talking about like <laughs> once you got the green light and you knew you're going to make the movie, what was the big challenge that you really felt like the one that you were very scared about? I think finding the right tone for the film because yeah. um, I love genre and folk horror is a real inspiration to me, but I also really enjoy Bergman and I wanted to tell a story that felt emotional and really character driven so finding that balance of the genre moments and how that plays in the film and yeah. you know not not betraying the genre or not giving people the wrong expectation and i think that was always a tightrope that we were walking mm. yeah. did you with there's a few what i would call jump scares in the movie people could have a reaction were you did you look at any films prior to did you look at any films to see like how you wanted to set it up or was it sort of a culmination of all the films you'd watched yeah, so I, I love a lot of the sort of old British horrors. There's a trilogy, an unholy trilogy, which is kind of the beginning of folk horror. Um, and I've always been a fan of horror, but I kind of looked at films more, more recently, even like It Comes at Night and The Witch, where they are horror, but they cross over into something else. And they are sort of in this sort of world between genres. And that's one of the things with this film is that I think I want, to, I want to be careful about how much I talk about the climax of the film and what happens because... I've been avoiding I, it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really enjoy, and that was the beautiful thing about yesterday, the audience not having an expectation. We actually changed the title of the film mm. to 
remove some of the expectations people might have. Yeah. So you go in and you go on the journey and these things unfold in front of you and that, that impact. I mean, we can't hold on to that forever. People are going to find out, but I think it's a really, it's an important part of the storytelling for me of, the, of this film. It's so funny. My next question was literally, how did you decide on the title when? <laughs> and what were the alternate titles? But I guess you shouldn't say them. Well, I don't mind. Um, it's all on IMDb anyway. Um, so interestingly, going back to Dread, it was called The Dark Outside, mm. just because that's where Dread comes yeah. from, the fear of what's in the dark outside. Yeah. But that title sets an expectation from the get-go of mm -hmm. horror. And our, our film for the first 20 minutes barely has any music and it's all about you and the world you live in. So yeah. I think that's misleading. So I think Gwen really just, for me, focused the film down to it's about you and your experience and your journey. Yeah. That journey goes into a dark place. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated is I feel like uh, I love it when films capture a moment in, in history where you feel like you're actually there. It felt very authentic, yeah. you know, that, that we were in that moment. Mm -hmm. So talk about, like, trying to be as authentic as you can to that time period and the research you did to make yourself feel comfortable to be able to act that way, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we went to the Slate Museum in Clamberis, which is in the general area where we were shooting, and we spoke to a historical expert, but we weren't kind of limiting ourselves to, you know, the particular social standards of the time. It was great to have a, a basis for it and to kind of explore what you could and couldn't do, but it wasn't like a, a rigid kind of rule that we had to stick by. Yeah, I, I had um, feedback from historical experts that we worked mm. with during the script as well. Yeah. And it is always good to know like the clapping game is historically inaccurate and they <laughs> wouldn't have played it. But the option I was given was uh, noughts and crosses and I just thought that wasn't very cinematic so <laughs> we broke a few rules it's not the only one we broke but sometimes you just you know take the research yeah. learn from it decide whether to use it or not mm -hmm. yeah it, it's still uh, it's also uh, just beautiful locations mm -hmm. um, I would uh, was, was there ever talk a little bit about finding the location and why you wanted that particular the way it's setting yeah sure so I love the effect of the sublime and if we're talking about dread and eerie I think a lot of that comes from landscape and yeah. I think in the UK we have these incredible landscapes which gave birth to folk tradition and folk beliefs and that was something incredible to play with yeah. so I actually went and stayed out in Snowdonia would just go rent a cottage spend all morning walking around finding locations and then the afternoon I'd spend writing um, so a lot of the things that I would find and photograph during the day would inform what I wrote later on. Um, so that was quite a nice process to have. I was going to say, so, uh, uh, the locations actually caused inspiration for uh, the movie. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been uh, asking, I've been having everyone who comes in uh, play something called Get to Know Your TIFF Attendee. And uh, you guys oh. are about to play. Okay. Uh, <laughs> here we go. It's, I'm telling you, it's pretty simple and you will not be upset. Okay. okay. I hope so. Uh, what, for you, what TV show would you love to guest spot on? And for you, what TV show would you love to guest write and direct? Oh, wow. Oh, that's a difficult one. You can give two shows if you have two. Oh, my. Can you go first? <laughs> Ah, Black Mirror. Oh. Because they're incredible. And I think they reflect on what what we're experiencing in our day-to-day -day lives and do something incredibly interesting with it. And each one is its own standalone thing. And the yeah. people they get involved are just brilliant. So, yeah, that would yeah. be awesome. I mean, something like that. <laughs> I'm just going to hop on the bag of that. Yeah, you that. could be in my Black Mirror. Uh, there we go. Right there. <gasps> yes, this needs to happen. Yeah. Somebody make this happen. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite sci-fi or fantasy film? I'm, I don't watch a lot of sci-fi. Sure. But when I was a kid, I used to absolutely love watching anything fantastical or, you know, I, I was obsessed with fairy tales and, oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, man, I don't know where to start. I mean, Dark Crystal, but then also Labyrinth. I love all that. Something that's just connected to my childhood like that really yeah. just resonates with me. Um, uh, I'm really excited to see another TV series, but his Dark Materials trilogy. Sure. Um, oh, because I'm a big yeah. fan of the books, I and I, I can't wait to see that. So, yeah. Uh, what film scared you as a kid? Oh, what film didn't scare me as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I can't remember the first horror film I ever watched, but I certainly remember as a kid there were 
there was certain I remember being scared in Scooby Doo. That was that was the first time I ever had a nightmare. There was an episode of Scooby Doo that terrified me. And Do you know which one it what it, happened? There was an old man and he was walking around saying, Come, come to me or something scary like that. <laughs> so yeah. That, that was probably the first time. Right, and, and the thing that she's not telling us is it was when she was 14. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which wasn't that long ago. It right. was, um, yeah, just a couple of years I, ago. <laughs> I remember, um, you know how you just, as a kid, like you're up late watching TV, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but it was a Yang Svankmeyer animation. Oh my god! And it was, these, it was just these faces of clay, and they were just changing, and oh. that was always just stayed with me. Because it was out of context. I didn't know what it was. I just stumbled across it late night on TV, and... I actually kind of use that as inspiration of, I almost want people when they've watched something that I've made to feel like they've turned on the TV late at night mm -hmm. and stumbled across something strange they otherwise wouldn't have uh, <laughs> discovered. So yeah. that's sort of stuck with me actually. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you collect? I don't, I don't think so, unless we're talking about hair ties or something. Hair ties <laughs> do <laughs> count. I've heard some very interesting answers. <laughs> Uh, probably Blu-rays, to be honest. Uh -huh. So, sure. Yeah, that's kind of an obvious answer, I guess. <laughs> no, no. I, I, uh, yeah. A lot of people have uh, moved more into like streaming. You know, in terms of, I think it's uh, it takes a, it takes a. Uh, so, yeah, this is the thing with my Blu-ray collection. It's like, I don't want to own everything. Yeah. It's curated, so it's like what I really want to have. I'll. Now, what happens together. if someone gives you like a free Blu-ray? Do you accept it and add it to the collection? No, or there's a separate shelf. Ah, uh, it, it isn't even there visible. <laughs> So it's like really, it is highly curated. Yeah, it's like, also I want it to be a kind of inspiration. So I want to see it and think, and those films inspire me. Hmm. Um, do you own any movie or TV show props? I mean, apart from the stuff that I've worked on, no. That you've stolen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Borrowed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is from a job I did a couple of years ago, and I, I rarely take it off. But that's it's special to me because it's kind of a, a memory in my first big TV break, and it kind of brings me back to that. I keep all the clapper boards for oh. things I've worked on, <laughs> apart from someone stole ours on Gwen, so I don't have that. Really? If they watch this interview. <laughs> back. Yeah. Uh, that, I, that, that sucks. Yeah, or, or we lost it in the mud. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, so because they knew it would feet. be such a collectible. <laughs> four feet of mud just yeah. swim through and you'll find it. <laughs> uh, what would people be surprised to learn about you? Oh. Besides, you're scared by Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Almost had a career in professional rugby, apart from I dislocated both my knees. So, what? Although I'm quite a big guy, so maybe that's not that surprising. But. Um, it's a good answer. Yeah. I've never broken a bone. There you go. There's, there's something nobody does. That goes quite well with my one, There actually, you go, yeah. exactly. Pairs. <laughs> uh, have you ever watched a TV show all the way through more than once? Oh. Mostly comedy. Yeah. So like Garth Marenghi's Dark Place or <gasps> yes! stuff like that, where you just oh, get back yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is the background photo on your phone? My dog. I'm pretty basic. <laughs> it's actually you on mine because it's the <laughs> it's a shot from Gwen of you walking out into the oh mist. Oh my so. god. Yeah. Cool. Uh, have you wa have you ever watched a movie more than twenty times? Definitely, as a kid, I'm sure there's bound to be at least several Disney films <laughs> where I've gone, right, let's stick that one on again. Uh, that's hard to keep track to that point. Of yeah. Um, or, I mean, it could be over 30, you know, is there, yeah. or 40 for you or 50, because yeah, right. I've, I've seen Star Wars or like certain movies, you know, probably more than 50 times. <laughs> I'm being honest. I, I think I've watched Gladiator quite a lot. I think that's probably one that I've probably watched a fair few times. Yeah. Um, yeah, I tried. I tried not to do too many repeat viewings though, because yeah. my to watch list gives me anxiety. Yeah, so I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, try get, and watch new it. stuff. Yeah. It's always getting longer. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have that same issue with TV. There's just an abundance oh. of amazing television yeah. now, and I, I that's a thing. But if, speaking of Gladiator, uh, if you're here tomorrow, Hans Zimmer will be here. I I've got that in my uh, oh. iCal. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and. Uh, and an editor I really like, Joe Walker's doing He's, a He'll be here tomorrow too. Yeah, so yeah. he'll be there for that, so. FYI, yeah. we'll talk off camera. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite pair of sneakers or shoes? 
whichever is easiest to put on to get out yeah. of the flat on time to get to set normally. Yeah. Is it okay to say slippers? Like <laughs> sure. teddy bear slippers? 100%. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, do you me- My last question for you. Do you remember what got you interested in wanting to be in the entertainment industry? Um, it's hard to pin it down. I just used to love writing little story ideas and taking pictures and... Um, I just inherited a little handy cam and started making documentaries on the farm where I grew up and just filming and I think it was probably seeing like a behind the scenes which is one thing that streaming is killing is like mm. uh, d- the sort of like director's commentary and behind sure. the scenes yeah. and that's actually uh, where I started to realise that people made these films um, yeah and that I could maybe do it too one day <laughs> I think I knew from a very young age it was what I wanted to do um, it was always in me. I mean, my first day of nursery, I'd climbed to the top of a bookcase and sung Hey Big Spender to the whole classroom. So, you know, it, it, it was always in me. By the way, to perform. that's why it's in the film, right? That's why I want to ask to improvise this scene. I get it, I get it now. Yeah, I was going to say, you could have used that also. What would people be surprised to learn about you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you but go. Just, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was, it was always something that I wanted to do, but I didn't know it was something that children could actually pursue. I thought it was like a, a very select amount of people that were adults who were allowed to do that. That's the funny thing is you've actually got more experience than I have <laughs> and I'm like twice your age. <laughs> um. <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah it, it all just kind of happened. I, it all fell into place and, and I'm really happy I am where I am now. Completely. I listen. I really mean it. Congratulations on the movie. Thank you. Uh, it really, uh, it really captures that sense of dread mm-hmm. and you know unknowing as you're yeah. watching. Um, and I think I messed up at the beginning of this interview by not saying a huge thank you to House of Aurora, who are our sponsor mm-hmm. and awesome. And I so appreciate uh, them partnering up with us to make interviews like this yeah. possible here at the Toronto Film Festival. Mm-hmm. On that note, thank you both so much for coming in and enjoy the rest of the fest. Thank Thank you you very very much. much. Cheers.